really happy, uh, guys, to be uh, returning to Dante. As you know, we've taken a um, couple of days uh, break, uh, partly because we were, as I mentioned uh, earlier, in D.C. And But now I'm glad to be back and picking it right up. Now, there's a saying in Dante's scholarship that when you have finished reading the poem, you're ready to read it again. <laughs> and you may think, why? Why would, why would you read the same poem twice or let alone more than that? And, and the answer is you begin to see as you read this poem that Dante has very ambitious goals. And his goals are, number one, to make you a wiser person. Number two, to make you a happier person. And number three, to help you on your journey to the paradiso, in other words, to make you a holier person. And Dante is very explicit that this is what he's trying to do. This is not an ordinary poem. Oh, you read it for fun. Yeah, you do, but there's a lot uh, more to it. My goal in this series is to play, well, it's to sort of play Virgil, right? Virgil is Dante's guide. It's a guide, not of Dante the poet, but of Dante the pilgrim. And Virgil is leading Dante the way through, but not all the way through. At some point, Virgil is like, now you got to go with other guides or go on your own. And that's my hope here, too, is, is to guide you in reading this poem. But I actually want to point you eventually to the poem so that you can be your own guide. And, um, and I think also it's fun to read the poem to get an edition of Dante that has the English translation on the right and the Italian on the left. There are a number of translations that are like that. And what I do sometimes is I just go over to the Italian and I, I don't, you know, I speak very little Italian, but I read the words because you can capture some of Dante's melody and it almost makes you feel bad. Like, wow, I'm not getting the poem in its full power. I'm getting it at like 60% because I need to learn Italian. And in fact, I need to learn sort of late medieval vernacular Italian to, um, to fully get Dante, not only in the message, but also in the medium. Now, we're talking about uh, Francesca and Paolo. We're talking about Dante in the fifth canto of uh, the Inferno. And um, it's important to see here that uh, the unrepentance of the sinner, um, in this case, Francesca, is uh, really beautifully shown by Dante in the way she talks and in what she says. It's very clear that uh, she is um, not in any way regretful about what she did. And in fact, her need is to compulsively justify and explain and, in a sense, put the blame on someone else. And the ingenious, charming way that she does this is kind of a metaphor for all the sinners in the, um, in the deeper circles of hell. There's a kind of a prototype. And uh, even though the sins get more grievous, the technique of the sinner is always the same. It's sort of, I'm the center of the universe and everything has to be seen from my perspective. And what's so clear here is I told you a little bit the backstory of Francesca. She was kind of caught in the act with her brother-in-law, this guy named Paolo. The husband comes bursting in, kills them both. That's why they're here in this, well, Dante calls it an infernal storm. And so you've got the sinners, the evil spirits, in Dante's words, being hurled about left and right. They, they're they literally out of control. They're just being buffeted. And for Dante, this is a, I think, a beautiful way in which the moral geography of hell matches the sin itself. Dante is not just coming up with sort of ingenious uh, punishments or ever more macabre ways of uh, hurting uh, the sinners. Rather, the, the punishment is kind of what you really wanted, what your sin was about, what you wrongly coveted. In this case, um, what Paolo and Francesca coveted, what they wanted most was to be, you may say, out of control, out of control. And so Dante is like, okay, you got it. You can have it. And uh, here is the your desire itself, but stripped of its kind of veneer of, of appeal. Now, what's remarkable about the story as Francesca talks to Dante is Dante does not give you the, the full story. Well, why not? Because neither does Francesca. She's telling a highly selective, edited version uh, of what happened. And this is all so important that I'm actually going to do it kind of line by line. Um, but uh, what I want 
to, to point out right here that this is kind of why we need notes for reading Dante, because if you didn't have the notes, see, the, the Paolo Francesca scandal was kind of a big scandal in Dante's own time. So Dante's readers knew about it. It's kind of similar to things we might hear about Marilyn Monroe or O.J. Simpson. And so if you write about Marilyn Monroe, O.J. Simpson, you don't have to actually say, well, Marilyn Monroe, she took pills, or O.J. Simpson. No, because people already know that. And so what's interesting here is to listen to what Francesca says, but the notes help us to understand the full story, the, the backstory, what Francesca is leaving out. But, but Dante lets her speak. Uh, Dante never challenges her narrative. He never goes, but wait a minute. Or he never goes, what a bunch of nonsense. No. In fact, you'll, as you'll see, Dante is very much taken in by what Francesca says. And this shows a couple of things. One is it shows that this is actually a sin that appeals to Dante. And by appeals to Dante, what I mean is this is a sin that Dante himself, in his own love poetry, that was, uh, which was mostly what he wrote before he wrote the Divine Comedy, Dante is very tempted himself by the same things that tempted Francesca. And Francesca talks in a way, as we'll see, that matches Dante's own love poetry. So this is, this is hitting Dante very close to home. Let's remember Dante is a very, you know, almost called him like a classic Italian. In one of his earlier poems, I remember, I'm not sure if this is in the Vita Nuova, Dante talks about the fact that when a beautiful woman goes by, his head turns, to which I say, classic Italian. Dante is like that. Don't think of Dante as some kind of, you know, Luther in a monastery. This is a guy who's on the street of Italy. This is a guy who knows beauty when he sees it. So, so this is Dante, um, in a sense, listening to a woman and he knows the language that she is speaking. So here we go. Here's Francesca talking to Dante. O oh, living creature, gracious and so kind, who makes your way here through this dingy air to visit us, who stained the world with blood. Let's stop for a second. This is her first line to Dante. O oh, living creature. Now, in Italian, even better. O oh, animal. So she uses this very odd phrase to refer to Dante. And let's think for a moment about what it means to be an animal, an animal, as opposed to a human being. An animal is essentially a human being minus intellect and will. Animals don't have intellect in the sense that they can't reason, nor do they have, in a sense, the control that can put desire, if you will, at the behest of reason, that puts reason in the charioteer's position so it can kind of guide desire. Dante is not against desire, but he wants desire to be under the rule of reason. But animals can't do that. They respond to instinct. They respond, you may say, helplessly. And this is going to be absolutely key. This is going to be Francesca's self-defense. She's going to argue, I did what I did because I sort of, I was taken captive. And you can see right here again, this infernal storm, these evil spirits being thrown around. Francesca is going to say, I was thrown around. I was, I was taken by love. Love captured me. And she uses beautiful phrases, love, she says, which absolves no one from loving. And then I want to just highlight one more phrase here, uh, gracious and so kind who makes your way here. So Francesca sort of acting like, Dante, it's really nice of you. I mean, this is an incredibly long journey for you, but you know, you've come all this way to see me. I mean, this is just unbelievably great. Now let's pause for a moment and realize that Dante is not there to see her. Dante is going through this journey because of his own spiritual malaise. Dante was in a dark wood. This is something that Dante has to do for his own, you may say, salvation. And yet Francesca doesn't care about any of that. She's not interested in why Dante is here. She's like, oh, oh, nice of you to drop in in this faraway place to play us a visit. Because for her, it's ultimately about her. She is like all the sinners in hell in the exact center of the universe. It, and so this kind of self-centeredness and the moral blindness that it produces, these are very important themes as we move um, into, the, into a deeper discussion of what Francesca has to say, which I will pick up next time.